Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss on the fifth Sunday of 2013 with a video tip about interlocking phrasing in the works of Tchaikovsky. To start with, just a few words of context here about the personal significance of the Pathétique Symphony, which we'll be studying in this video. There are all sorts of dramatic ideas about Tchaikovsky in this last symphony of his, that it was the cry of a tortured soul, a premonition of his impending doom, even that it was a suicide note. On top of this, his sudden illness and death have spawned many speculations that he was murdered, or he killed himself on orders from his colleagues. But let's be sensible about this. If you really look at the facts about Tchaikovsky's final years, you see that he was becoming one of the premier conductors of his era. His repertoire was carefully composed and selected to showcase his abilities, not as a composer, but as a performer. At the time he wrote his Sixth Symphony, he'd recently completed a successful world tour and was booked for more dates. He needed new material, and he needed it fast. That material had to contrast the Fifth Symphony in a big way, and build on the positive feedback he got from audiences and musicians. Pathetique Symphony is a conductor's showpiece. It requires a high degree of intimacy between conductor and orchestra, which immediately pays off emotionally for the audience. Its structure would also cause a storm of controversy and grab attention in making the third movement into a finale and the fourth into an elegy. Tchaikovsky was betting that he could end a symphony much more powerfully by leaving the audience with unfulfilled emotions, rather than the typical fulfillment of a rousing coda. And he was right. Another great experiment that he tries is the concept of interlocking phrasing. To truly understand this, you have to hear it played with old-style seating, with the first violins on the left and the seconds on the right. What happens is that the notes of the melody flick back and forth across the hall with indescribable smoothness and elegance, surrounding the listener with a kind of emotional stress and ambiguity. The top note of the melody starts in the second violins, then is picked up by the firsts, and then trades back and forth. The violas and cellos also play this game. Listen to this simulated excerpt on headphones at a reasonable volume. The strings have been panned as you'd experience them standing at the podium. This doesn't quite sound right, because my sound set doesn't slur very well, but I think you get the idea. The beauty of this score is actually in its imperfections. Played with perfectly balanced, homogeneous sounding strings, it actually loses some of its intensity. But it's not just the location in the concert hall that's supposed to be trading off notes, it's also the registers of each instrument, using different characteristic strings. For instance, look at the first chord. The top F-sharp is being played by the second violins in first position on the A-string, a very bright, raw sound. But on the next note down, the firsts are playing B on the D-string, a much subtler tone. This pattern is repeated below, with the cellos playing a very bright G-sharp on their A-string, and the violas a mellower D on the G-string. The next chord switches intensities of position and strings for everyone except for the violas. The situation is also complicated by the second violins being tilted away from the audience and the firsts toward. The result is a highly innovative passage. In fact, 
the whole symphony shows that Tchaikovsky was becoming interested in a more experimental approach. The first movement's very haphazard form, being dedicated more to emotional contrasts than intellectual credibility. The second movement's very natural and lyrical use of an odd time signature of 5 4. The fragmented yet relentless third movement that delays and undercuts the listener's expectations, before finally committing to an epic resolution. Let's not forget another example of interlocking phrasing, the horn octaves before figure A in the second movement. Each player slurs up or down an octave, interlocking with another player going the opposite direction. Tchaikovsky could just as easily have scored a simple unison of slurred staccato here, but this way he gets a slight bit of pickup and drop to the articulation of the second note of each pair. It's a subtle but beautiful distinction. So my final verdict on Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, based on this evidence, is that I just don't accept the notion that this was a self-indulgent, self-pitying eulogy for his impending mortality. That's nonsense. This final work took the form of a symphony and reshaped it into something less structured. Then it helped refine the symphony's role as public art into a virtuosic display by both conductor and orchestra. Tchaikovsky may have had tragic aspects to his life. But he was, above all else, a consummate professional who adjusted his personal circumstances amazingly well to his output. There's nothing final about this piece. Rather, it seems to open the door to a more intriguing direction. Remember my rule about great composers and their craft. The truth is always more complicated and much more worth knowing. For the past week, I've been posting a series of tips about orchestral phrasing on Facebook that you might find helpful. You can access these tips by clicking on the links below, or just joining the Orchestration Online group to get them in your daily feed. Join me next week for a tip about the tenor tuba and the ingenuity of Gustav Holst's orchestration.